You're now listening to the Brandon Brand Sports Podcast. Hey everybody, welcome to Brennan Brand. We are on the day of the Flames home opener. We're going to focus a lot on the Flames today, talk about the season opener in Colorado on the road. Team looked okay, came out on the losing end, but not a blowout. It didn't look like the playoffs last year where Colorado kind of rolled them after game one. It was a pretty competitive game, particularly after Lucic took exception to a Zadorov hit on Austin Zarnik. It seemed like the momentum swung a bit, but they could not overcome the avalanche. Uh, 5-3 victory, an empty netter there, so 4-3 for the most part. Uh, But the Flames on the losing end, they're playing the Canucks tonight. What do you think? Uh, Definitely not the start that Calgary would have wanted, especially given the the sting that still remains from the playoffs. But uh, Colorado, I do think, is going to be a good team this year. I think they're one of the better teams in the West um, and even after watching them early in the season here, uh, I don't think losing to them is anything to be ashamed of. With Vancouver on deck, however, very much looking forward to this game. I haven't been to a home opener before, so I'm very excited. I'm very excited for the energy. I'm very excited for the game itself. And I've been saying it for a while, but I really hope the Canucks pull it together this year. Not because I'm a Canucks fan by any means, but... I do miss the old rivalry back when both the Flames and Canucks were good. Some of the most fun hockey that I have ever watched. Yeah, the Canucks and Flames both had futility on their first games back on the ice for this season. The Vancouver Canucks played the Edmonton Oilers tight game 3-2. Connor McDavid having the game winner there. Don't know if you can tell what the teams are going to be like based on one game. But the Vancouver Canucks did lose to the Lowly Oilers. I I think Calgary's going to have a, you know, a successful year. You can't judge a team in October. I mean, last year, the Flames had a 9-1 loss to Pittsburgh, and everyone kind of thought, oh my God, what's going on? And after that, they just totally tore it apart the rest of the year. So, you know, I, I think they'll beat Vancouver tonight, but it's always good. Hockey night in Canada, home opener. You've never been, but I've been for the last 10 years. This will be my 10th in a row. I love the home opener. It's a bit expensive, but it, the the atmosphere, the energy, it's huge. Uh, everyone's pumped up, and I think everyone has pretty high expectations for the Flames this year. Looking at uh, the Flames roster and um, what they've put together going into this season, I think this is likely the best chance they've had at a Stanley Cup run or will have in quite some time. I don't know. I mean, their, their core is fairly locked up as it stands but I think with the roster that they have now I would be shocked if they didn't make a deeper run yeah I think this year coming off you know a record setting points per per season for the Flames it's there's expectations are high at least their top two lines you know one and two are some of the best in hockey although the second line didn't really do that well against Colorado they were all minus two Kachuk did get an assist on the power play but that's a good segue. The power play looked good. They had two goals. Uh, both Johnny and Monty had a goal and an assist. Uh, Captain Mark Giordano had an absolute snipe job on his goal. Uh, Derek Ryan and Sam Bennett, who I absolutely adore, got the assists on that one. Uh, but again, I was talking to you about this before. And Rantanen is an absolute certified Flames killer. He and McKinnon look absolutely dynamite. I would arguably say they're the best line in hockey. They can stay healthy together. They'll be on the top top of the West Division, no doubt. But again, like last year when Rantanen got hurt, they they faltered a bit. But when they got him back for the last month, they absolutely look like one of the best teams in hockey. Looking at Calgary right now, it doesn't look like a team that has very many flaws as far as. The biggest area of concern for this team playing along, I would think, is to try and not buy into the hype, since they seem to be, at least in part, favored by quite a few people coming out of the West and to uh, do some damage. It will be an issue if they let it get to their own heads, especially if they have a poor start out of the gate. Like, they could fail before it even begins. Yeah, I, I think they've got a lot more than they had last year. Obviously, the core's the same. You know, the top two lines, you still got Bennett, Jankowski, Mangiapane uh, to round out the third and fourth lines. But that addition of Lucic still remains to be seen how effective he can be. But the Flames don't need 
the scoring from Lucic. Uh, I think the Oilers did. They, they expected him to be a force offensively and physically, but we just need his physicality. We don't need him to put up a ton of points. He can put up some pretty effective power play minutes as well, standing in front of the net, uh, pushing people around. But I love the addition of Lucic. You know, if he if he only hits 20 points, I don't think anyone cares. It's all about the force and the presence uh, and his, you know, leadership in the locker room. I think he he brings another element to the Flames that they never had. And that's that's a really positive thing going into a playoff run. The Flames have been very ineffective in implementing their their common style in the regular season in the in the playoffs. Uh, if you go back to 14-15, the first year Johnny Gaudreau had a full year, uh, they made the playoffs, won that first round against Vancouver, but since then they played the Ducks twice and have only won two games uh, in three playoff series in the last five years. So they really need to make that push in the playoffs and you know, changing the outlook or the overall team dynamic is I think what Brad Tree Living did, and I think that's why he's been rewarded with that contract extension. Wow, which is huge for the Flames. I want to touch on Lucic a little bit more because uh, when that trade happened, Oilers fans everywhere were rejoicing at the foolishness of the entire thing. But I do think, in addition to what you mentioned about uh, stationing him in front of the net and making goalies' lives hell, that Stanley Cup experience, should they make the playoffs, and they absolutely should, will absolutely come in handy because as I think about it now, I think Froelich might be the only other guy with a ring on that team. Correct me if I'm wrong on that, though. No, I I, I think you're completely right. And Fro Leak was the subject of trade rumors all summer. They were trying to make cap space, and you know, kudos to Brad Tree Living. He's you can say what you will about him as his abilities as a, a a general manager, but he's juggled that cap beautifully. He got everybody locked up, including that first line, Gaudreau, Monaghan, Lindholm, Backlund, now Kachuk with that short-term bridge deal. Froelich is up at the end of the year. So is Brody. Uh, But I think both those guys are expendable. Yeah, I wouldn't expect either of those two to be back. Tree Living, too, has been just a wonderful GM uh, since coming in. I think he was at Arizona before doing the assistant thing. He was. Um, yeah. But he has just been uh, fantastic. At least in my time of following this team, he hasn't really shelled out any really bad contracts. There's been a couple missteps along the way, but nothing too offensive to the point where you would want him gone. He's just been absolutely masterful in handling the dollars and cents side of this thing, which a lot of teams can't really say. Uh, other teams have their big stars locked up and and what else, but, you know, someone like the Toronto Maple Leafs are just going to be an absolute cap hell in a year, year or two, which the Flames should be okay as they move forward. Well, I don't know, but if you fast forward three years, the Flames are going to find themselves a bit of a pinch too. Gaudreau's due for a big time raise. So is Monaghan. Uh, but at the time, they've got a three-year window here where everyone's kind of locked up, and th- this is their chance because they're going to have to do some shuffling in that three-year term. But the Flames, right now is their time. We want them to all get going. They showed flashes of it last year. They're one of the better teams. They're fast. They're very cohesive. They're all like brothers out there. Uh, and that's what Lucic referred to it. You know, he he stepped up for one of his brothers the other day when when Zarnik got uh, unpenalized, by the way, a a blatant hit from behind. He's bruised up right now in the eye. So that's another thing with the NHL. I mean, you see these fluff penalties being called and you see something egregious like that get thrown out. A lot of people said Lucic sucker punched Zadarov, but he was just stepping up. Uh, It is a bit of a sucker, but he was just saying, you know what, I'm going to get fired up. He says he feels different than he did the last year and a half when he was playing with Edmonton, where he admits fully that he kind of fell off and he didn't have that spark, that, you know, that push to be the guy he was when he was with Boston. And that's the thing, you know, when he when he was with Boston and they, they won that cup and they had a finals run there where they lost to Chicago, shockingly, uh, but he was never leaned on to score he did you know he played with Krejci and he played with some good players there but that was never the MO for Boston when he was there he was there to be that physical guy if he got a bunch of goals that's gravy that's great but 
I think he's in a similar situation with the Flames. He's not going to play top two minutes, but he's going to get some power play time. Yeah, he just he's there to be the guy everyone fears to go on on the ice on. Lucic's biggest problem is that he's slow of foot. And if he's put in a situation, which they shouldn't, they should absolutely try and shelter him from this. But if he's put in a situation where he's got to try to keep up on the uh, the speed train of today's NHL, like he's just going to get exposed, which was... I. I think his biggest problem in Edmonton, but you're right. He provides that physical presence. I mean, I think I can speak for NHL players, even though I'm not one, when I say that if I have Milan Lucic coming towards me on the ice uh, with the mean grimace on, uh, I'll be looking for a new pair of shorts. <laughs> yeah, he he says he's he's got that smile back when he's playing, you know, up to his top level. He's, he does have that smirk on, and he's looking for that confrontation. He's looking to push the other guy the other way and protect his brothers, like I said. But, you know, the one guy I really am curious about this year is Sam Bennett. Like I said, I love the guy. He brings a lot of intangibles to the table. Uh, he was drafted fourth overall, and we drafted him for different reasons, but he's kind of fell into a different niche now. And he... He provides a spark just like Lucic, but on on a different level. He's he's a lot smaller, obviously. He's still got skill, but when you got a guy that wants to push the other side, you know, can chip in ten to fifteen goals a year. Uh, he's got the leadership intangibles, like I said. He is the guy to watch this year and how he kind of guides. I guess the momentum of the team because you know you got like guys like. Gaudreau, who are always going to score, but are they all? Are they going to put in that emotional charge? Probably not. You're looking to other guys for that. So I, I like the way Sam Bennett does that. Sam Bennett actually is a very curious case to me because I really do think even with the player that he is today, he can still, given the right opportunity, put in 40 points. But more importantly, I do think he would be a candidate uh, to eventually take the C from Mark Giordano when Gio finally calls it a day, whenever that may be, because uh, Sam Bennett is a very heart and soul guy. And, uh, you know, we've talked about it before, but playoffs it, against the Avalanche, he was one of the only visible people really on the ice during that series. And in times of dire need, he seems to be one of those guys that will always step up and take it to another level, which, you know, the Flames desperately need. Yeah, no, I, I think you're completely right. In the playoffs, he was one of the only bright spots. Uh, just from a physical standpoint, he chipped in a few goals. Uh, but he was the guy that you could see on the ice that was always putting 100% in. It seemed like after game two, where the Flames lost heartbreakingly in overtime and then got pounded 6-2 the next day, or the next game, uh, it seemed like a lot of the guys just didn't have the heart and soul to keep going they almost admitted defeat defeat at that time sam bennett wasn't one of those guys he was the guy that kept pushing kept trying uh they did get pounding game three they did lose in overtime giving up a two nothing lead in the third period to even get to overtime colorado ended up winning but uh he was the guy even in the last game of game five where it, all hope was lost everyone knew that uh, he still had a pretty good showing. So he uh, he's getting paired with some different people now, as, uh, at least looking at the Game 1 starting lineup. Uh, he was with uh, Lucic and Derek Ryan on the third line. They pushed Jankowski down to the fourth line. Uh, Jankowski, I think, has been a bit of a disappointment. I like he's got a big body. He, You know, his temperament kind of reminds me of Sean Monaghan. They're big guys, but they just don't seem to have that you know, lightening up the butt kind of physicality or just getting going. But Mark my words, and I will say this about Mark Jankowski, and you heard it here first, I do believe he will be one of the pieces dangled uh, at the trade deadline when uh, they embark on their ever-consistent search for a top-line right winger. Um, I think Jankowski, maybe TJ Brody, I think that's what they offered Colorado for Nazem Kadri, actually, last year. But... Those are the two guys, at least in my mind, that stand out as uh, as trade bait. Yeah, TJ Brody. I people that know me know what I feel about TJ Brody. He he can be masterful for periods of time, but I think overall he's just he's a great skater, but he coughs up the puck a lot. His defensive awareness is just sometimes you don't even know what he's looking at. 
uh, especially last year in Colorado, man, every time he touched the puck, he was turning it over. Uh, that being said, is there value there? Absolutely. I don't know if they're going to get any top tier type of return for TJ Brody, but there will be teams out there come, you know, the trade deadline that'll be looking for someone like that. And, you know, if Valimaki, his knee injury goes well, there's a possibility he could be available for the playoffs, but that's a pretty serious injury he sustained. So he might be gone all year, but if there is that opportunity to insert him, TJ Brody's expendable. Absolutely. Well, and teams are always looking for defensemen at the trade deadline. It's one of the most coveted things that, that goes on at that time of year. Uh, looking at this roster, though, who would you say is the weakest link on the team that could potentially make or break, uh, depending on performance? Well, I, I think in terms of skill and output the last few years, I, I think Michael Froelich is the guy that's kind of the odd man out. He does have the benefit of playing on the second line with Backlund and and Kachuk, and they've got you know they've got that pedigree so to speak because they've played together for the last two. This will be their third kind of consistent minutes together. So he he's still got gas in the tank. There's no doubt, and I think he does have some value on the trade market. But I I don't. I've always said. I mean, even going back last year, I thought he should be playing fourth line minutes, but there is a bit of chemistry there you can't ignore it you know they're going to ride it as long as they can but I, I just Michael Froelich he just he's so invisible for like five game stretches way too long for, yeah and you know he'll throw a couple goals in and then you know next month you'll be like oh where's Michael Froelich well he's played every game he hasn't done anything um, so I think he's the guy that's probably the odd man out there. That's an interesting point, and to be honest, I'm shocked you didn't say goaltending. Like, it still stands out to me uh, with that area that it's just too shady with Riddick and Talbot. And I like David Riddick. I'm, I don't want to trash the guy because when he's good and on, like, he's good, you know, and he's entertaining to watch, which is the other thing. But well, I just think... I. People, I've had this conversation with a lot of people, and people are always like, "Oh, the goaltending, this, that, and the other." Uh, the goaltending wasn't the, the 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 factor that broke the backs of the Calgary Flames in the playoffs last year. Mike Smith played gloriously. Um, you know, when you're giving up almost sixty shots a game, like what do you expect from a goaltender? I mean, it it comes down to the fundamentals defensively. Giordano didn't have a good playoff. Brody, like I said, was absolutely horrendous, and they just broke down. I mean, Colorado played well. There's no doubt about it. And the Flames were close in a lot of games. They won the first game 4 nothing, But that wasn't the issue. So Mike Smith's been shipped out of town. Uh, he had a great game against he Vancouver. He looked fantastic. He looked Absolutely awesome. fantastic. Like, he was, um, he was on his game for sure. Absolutely. And I, I just don't think that the goaltending situation in the last two, three years, it just, it's not been the issue. The Flames just seem to fall asleep at certain points in time defensively. Uh, and that's a trickle-down effect from, you know, Gaudreau disappeared. They they shut him down. They double-teamed him. Like I said, Monaghan, he needs to get fired up. He, he He's great at being at the right place at the right time in the regular season, but he doesn't seem like that guy that has that push when it comes to playoff time when everyone just elevates their game. So I think it... If the offense would have got going against Colorado, the defense wouldn't have looked as bad, but you got the double whammy there where both just seemed to fall apart. And Mike Smith was just sitting back there getting shelled, and he kept them in it the best he could, but uh, it was just too overwhelming. So, I mean, theoretically, let's say they get rid of Froelich at the deadline, bump Bennett up, and then you're in search of another bottom six guy. Do they fill internally or do, do they bring somebody else in? Well, that's the thing. I think you can, like, for O'Leak's making just under $5 million a year, I and mean, that's a pretty big hit for a guy like him. Uh, yeah, I think you could trade him away and probably get someone equal or just slightly lesser value for a lot less money. But I, I think you, you do a straight-up winger for winger in that type of deal, whether that be a young guy or a veteran. But... I think they'll probably have to settle on some form of third, fourth round draft pick mm -hmm. and maybe, uh, you know, an AHL or that'll get thrown in there. He's not, he's, he doesn't have a ton of value, but he can help a playoff contender. 
And I actually like the guy, again, when he is contributing, be it as sporadic as he is, he is valuable, but it's just not enough. Um, when this season concludes, and we're talking regular season, where do the Flames sit? Well, I think they can contend for that division again. I mean, you look at the, the division they're in, and it doesn't seem overly strong. The Ducks are going to step back. The Sharks are probably going to step back. Vegas is still good. Arizona had a stinker in the home opener loss to Anaheim. I thought they'd be okay, but again, this one game. But they might hover around that eighth spot. Edmonton, no one knows. I mean, so it's it's pretty wide open for them. I, I think they're the best skilled team out of all the bunches in that division. So I think sky's the limit for them. Uh, would I be torn if they didn't win? I think it might actually be a good thing. You look at last year when they had no meaning meaningful games in March and it probably hurt them in the playoffs. If they're in there kind of fighting for position or I hate to say wild card because I don't think they'll fall that far, but if they are fighting for it, it might actually bode well for them. Yeah. I, I would have to say maybe fourth or fifth in the West right around there. Uh, not quite at the top, but not quite the bottom of the group. And again, you're probably right that uh, it will make them less complacent uh, to do a better run. Uh, looking at that division, though, as I just popped it open, like <laughs> teams that we just don't talk about at all are uh, Arizona and Los Angeles, and like just completely v- invisible off the map there. And San Jose is another intriguing one too. I think San Jose is just going to be absolutely brutal this year. <laughs> like they don't look like a team to me uh, that has much shot of uh, even creeping into the eighth spot. Well, I don't know if it actually went through, but Evander Kane had that altercation with the referee. I saw that. (laughs) Uh, They were looking at a 10-game suspension. I don't know if that's going to be upheld or if an appeal is going to bring that down. But uh, that's a big hit for the first 10 games. I mean, if you you falter and go 2-8 and in the first 10 games, pretty difficult to make the playoffs, even if you have a, a respectable rest of the year. Uh, you got to count on Eric Carlson to play more than 50 games, and that hasn't happened in, <laughs> since whenever. <laughs> the guy's always hurt. He's great when he's on the ice. Uh, but, you know, you t- go back to goaltending there. Matt uh, Martin Jones is – he's okay. Uh, but the, the Sharks are definitely a team on the decline in my, in my mind. I think Vegas is the biggest contender to the Flames in that division. Which is so bizarre. Vegas is such a weird team to me. Like, even looking at their roster now, uh, it just doesn't look like a team on paper that should be as good as they are. It that, never has. No, it never has. Even since their inception, yeah. <laughs> and they were, they've were they been good ever since they came in. You know, you can put a lot of uh, praise on Marc-Andre Fleury, and he's been a big, big part of that. But everyone seems to just bind together. They, they're always one of the higher scoring teams in the league. Defensively, they're good. Uh, they seem to always have injury problems the last two years of their existence. And they just insert people and they pick up where the other guy left off. And, you know, they had that run uh, two years ago where they made the final, lost to Washington last year, gave up a 3-1 lead to the Sharks. They probably should have won that series. Uh, they're the scariest team. The, the, the Flames can't win in Vegas either. Uh, when Vegas comes to Calgary, it's a different story, but they are brutal when it comes to playing in the, in the desert. So, Do you buy into the Vegas curse with all the teams going out and partying when they go to play there? Do you buy into that at all? You know what? I think Vegas and Arizona are kind of those places where everyone goes to party. Scottsdale is a huge party scene. Uh, so is Vegas. Um, as of recent, Austin Matthews been called up for his <laughs> shenanigans in yes. Scottsdale. Uh, I don't know what to make of that, but that's neither here nor there. But Scottsdale and Vegas seem to be huge party spots. Players seem to get in trouble there. Uh, now it is time to touch on some other Calgary-related stuff with the Calgary Stampeders uh, and their star quarterback, Bo Levi Mitchell. Uh, very interesting stuff uh, coming from him in regards to the Vikings camp. Yeah, I mean, recently on his own show, he he, he blatantly admitted that, uh, you know, his first interview or first encounters with management in Minnesota, they, they kind of asked him what he expected to get out of the tryout that he got this summer. And Bo being Bo, being very confident, I mean, he's a good quarterback, we all know that. 
but he said he want he wanted to compete and take the job from Kirk Cousins, and management there said, no, we that's not what we expect from you. We want you to come in, facilitate, back up, and uh, kind of push Kirk from behind, but we don't want you to take that spot. So he actually said, quote unquote, they feared him taking the job and there there's a lot of money tied up in Kirk Cousins I think it's guaranteed 84 million ish that is way too much for Kirk Cousins way too much <laughs> like super way too much I I'm a Redskins fan and I saw him uh for the first bunch of his years and he can be absolutely lights out but for the most part two-thirds of his outings he's pretty pretty vanilla let's put it that way uh, and he hasn't shown that this year. They're two and two. Can't put points on the board. He is the worst quarterback in terms of passing yards in the NFL so far. And they don't look like they're going anywhere. But in terms of Bo, I mean, I respect him wholeheartedly. That he he said, you know what? Thank you for the shot. I'm not interested. I want to play football, and that's why he's back in Calgary. It's a very strange uh, decision by Vikings management to me because wouldn't you want that guy to push, you know, this uh, star quarterback allegedly that you have who hasn't been performing up to par? You could bring in a guy like Bo Levi Mitchell and uh, have him compete for that job. And either or, like, even if Bo takes it, oh, great, you can get rid of Kirk Cousins. You know, like, it was short on dollars, but I'm sure they'll be fine. But in the long run, it probably would have been better for them. So, like... When I look at that situation and hear that story, it just doesn't make a lot of sense to me. And if I'm a GM, uh, I probably wouldn't have done that. Well, I, I don't understand. If it's guaranteed money to Kirk Cousins, what does it matter if he's playing football or sitting on the bench? You owe it to him anyways. I mean, you have to look at it from the perspective of what gives me the best chance to win, regardless of dollars I'm spending, because I'm going to be spending them anyways. Like, I go back to... Lucic and Neil that that deal everyone's like oh do we want Lucic well do we want Neil and it's a zero-sum game there you're not paying any one of them either less than the other it's it's straight up swaps so you know it what gives you the best chance to win and if you're not thinking that way then what kind of conspiracy are we really working with here? Like, do the, the Minnesota Vikings look at a guy that played in the Canadian Football League and say, we automatically think he's inferior and we can't put him on the field? Or do we think that the fans really just want Kirk Cousins? And I don't think that's the case. I think they just want them to win. Yeah, I mean, and that should be the case because it doesn't make sense. I don't think any group of fans are going to be married to a specific player if that player can't get the job done. Like, at the end of the day... It's sports, and success is defined by winning, and that's just how it is. Uh, that being said, uh, Bo Levi and his Stampeders are positioned pretty well to make another run at a Grey Cup despite all the early season adversity. Uh, they do not have much standing in their way right now. Yeah, I mean, they play the Riders next week, but they're tied right now, both at 9-4. and four. Uh, Currently, they're... You know, they're spanking Montreal 17-7. Bo Levi just threw a nice deep ball to, to Josh Huff. And uh, he looks like he's dialed in. He's undefeated since he came back from uh, the uh, the chest or shoulder injury. He, uh, he won it at Labor Day and hasn't lost since. So I don't think there's much standing in their way. They're going to get that first week by. I'm pretty confident. 100%. Yeah. Uh, you know, the riders might give him a bit of a stopping there in, in next Friday but I don't think that even if they lose that game I think they're going to be fine they uh they look like the team to beat like they have the last four years We're getting down to the wire here uh there is one more point non-Calgary related uh that we want to touch on as in California uh college athletes are now finally allowed uh, to be paid by endorsements uh, via an, a new bill. What can you tell us about that? Yeah, I, I think that's a huge development. I think it's been a travesty. You know, I know I'm somewhat a millennial in, in the fact that I'm under 40 years old, but it, it just seems like an archaic type structure that the NCAA is allowed to bar these guys from making money when they just pocket endless profits from college football. It's arguably bigger than the NFL. 
I mean, we will never know actual numbers, but the NCAA is a joke in terms of them being an administration. They want all the money to go to them. These players bring in absolute absurd amounts of money for each institution that they play for. You look like you look at teams like Alabama, Florida State, Texas, all these teams. Like their stadiums hold a hundred thousand people they sell out every week. And the TV rights are huge. Uh, these guys deserve to make money. Now, do I do I think they should make NFL type money? No, but I get there's a blurred line between professionalism and uh, you know being a college athlete. But these guys need to make something. I mean, a scholarship only goes so far. You know, these guys have nothing while they're playing, and these guys are making mountains of money. My concern, like. I'm I'm totally okay with the endorsement stuff, but like, say we start giving college players contracted money, whatever it is, where let's just put dollars to the side at this point. But my concern would be, don't these athletes, these players, already have enough going for them as it is? And I say this in the sense that like a lot of these guys are playing on scholarships. You know, you got the free ride thing. Um, as long as they do well in classes. They're absolutely adored, you know, when they're winning. They're basically uh, folk heroes in these towns, especially if there's no NFL teams around. Like you said, I mean, this very well could be uh, bigger than the NFL, and they're essentially treated like gods anyway. Uh, now, granted, I've never gone to a college in the States, but, you know, I've seen the TV shows. We've all seen those characters of the jocks that get away with, with everything, right? So if that is the case, and they're already being, you know, spoon-fed away to get themselves into the NFL and they're already in a position of power it, there could be some danger there by giving them even more of that with a big wad of money well I think you're coming at this from the angle of you're looking at the superstar Heisman candidates the guys that are going to go to the NFL and make a boatload of money but the, the truth of the matter is in division one you know 70 percent of these guys are not going to go professional but they're still adding to the the ambiance or the the level of the team. So if you look at a student, they're getting a free ride in terms of the scholarship for sure. But how do they eat? They still need money that way, and they're not getting that you know from their parents because a lot of these guys come from the quote unquote hood. You know, they're great athletes, but they come from the inner cities of Miami, Los Angeles, that kind of thing. Their parents don't have the money to give them those ancillary things. So, and and given the fact that most of them won't make professional money, I I really think that there's there's room for this. And I think it, as an overall perspective, I think it's good for these athletes. They, they need to get something uh, because there's just too many other people benefiting off the fruits of their labor. And, and that part I absolutely agree with because the NCAA does seem at least in part a little bit evil in terms of that. But where do you draw the line in terms of dollars? Like, Do you just write it into uh, the tuitions for the school or not tuitions but like – uh, the added bonus if you're on the team. I wouldn't know how that was how that would work or how you would make it fair. Uh, I can't imagine a college locker room when you've got uh, guys when you get to that dollar division, right? Uh, it's not like when you're out in the professional world and you just kind of accept it. Uh, these are college kids uh, who aren't quite fully developed, and that could start a lot of shit. I think. Well, I think the the worst thing about this whole thing, or the potential worst thing about this is if these guys are making money regardless of quantums you're in, you're going to have to introduce and accept the fact that these guys are going to have agents and agents as we know are <laughs> yeah. pretty slimy dudes so these guys aren't developed they actually don't know what is the best thing for them you know they're teenagers in a lot of respects young 20s um so i think that's the one thing i i don't know how that's going to play out but you start introducing agents at that age and it could turn into something ugly. Now, are we fooling ourselves? These guys probably have agents in the background, especially if they know that they're going to be a top tier, top 10 pick. Uh, they're highly touted, that kind of thing. You know, they might not have an official agent that's front and center in front of the camera, but I rest assured they're talking to people anyways. Uh, but it's the formality of having that agent involved that, you know, that it could turn things the wrong way. <laughs> However, we are going to go and enjoy 
enjoy some beers and take this game on. I can't wait. Yeah, this is going to be great. We're going to have a good time. Home opener. Uh, 1920 season kicking off. Let's go Flames. Uh, but until next time, sports fans, we will see you later. But in the meantime, don't be a dick on the internet.